Thank you. Um, thank you all so much for coming tonight. I'm very envious of you because that's my favorite seat right up there. I like to be sitting in the dark watching people or movies or anything like that, that other than be in front of you. So um, forgive some stammering that might happen tonight, please. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Lenny Frickman, the director of the Art Museum Gallery, because I'm so honored to be able to show there. And it's been great to be able to show five of my pieces together, which is a real rarity. And Suzanne Hale, thank you so much for all your help. The expertise of Keith Yench, I couldn't have done without. It was invaluable. And um, thank you so much to Dennis Bookstaber. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Bookstaber. And Dennis, forgive me for that. And Dan Butcher, too. Thank you. Um, my work is challenging to install. So one of the uh, things I really appreciate is having the time to be able to install it properly. And I am very envious of people hanging things on the wall, and then that's it. And I, I do um, en envy that ability to install quickly. However, my work usually requires several different points of installation. So it was very wonderful to be able to take the time to install here in May. I grew up, and I'm going to start at the beginning, so I grew up in this little bitty town called Purlington, Mississippi. It was named Purlington because it was on the Pearl River. And the Pearl River is behind that dot, that red dot. That red dot's really much bigger than Purlington. But it's that little um, part where the bottom of the heel of Mississippi butts up against the boot of Louisiana right over here. So, you know, this is Louisiana, that's Mississippi, and that little bottom section is the Pearl River, it's, that's the boundary line. <clears throat> and the place was really an amazing location, it's an amazing place to grow up. It was tiny, I was the only child, and uh, my best friend was an alligator, and his name was Albert. And one of the things that would happen yearly, this happened over the course of at least eight years, uh, Albert would come when I called. So alligators are very easily trained. That's why you should go on a swamp tour if you ever go down there, because they know the boats and they know the boat captains, and the boat captain has a big old chicken ready for them. And, and when he calls, they'll come up, they'll swim up, which is scary, equal parts terrifying and, and fascinating. And I was always fascinated with alligator. I never really thought much of um, the dangers <laughs> associated with this being a small child and letting my, um, having my mother give me stale ends of bread and say, here, the, you know, go feed this to Albert. So I would trot down to the river where there was a, <laughs> where there was a uh, dock and I would stand at the end of the, do the dock and scream, here, Albert, here, Albert. And sure enough, the darn thing, would, I would see this movement coming like this down the uh, boat slip and it would be an alligator. And you can see this is a piece of bread right here um, floating in the water. And he would always, always love to watch him just, he would butt his nose up against the bread and then go chomp like that, which I loved and dearly. And this, these are some of my first photographs too. Of course, he was one of my first subjects. And uh, I took, through Girl Scouts, I took a black and white photography course. And it was one of the things that changed my, my life. Um, Albert would come back every year, so I knew that I learned early on about cycles and about how uh, the alligator would hibernate in the winter, and it was always a highlight when he would return in the spring. As soon as the weather started getting warm, I would go back out to the boat slip and start calling him. And sure enough, him or some other alligator, but I like to think it was him, would swim on up and I would start feeding the thing bread. And my parents thought it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> and this is um, the other, my other friends were trees. So this is a tree that's right, that was right outside of our house. And, and the area behind it is all marsh. And really that section of the world 
is mostly marsh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Marsh, cypress forest, and oak forests, and other various trees, but this is just some source footage that I had shot um, after Hurricane Katrina. The storm really defoliated the trees, and you can see the branch structure very clearly of the trees. So this is me just documenting the branches, and um, eventually I thought I might go back and use this footage and piece together a tree and make it move, but I never did. However, I do use it as, as source footage. And you can see that there were, there were just lines of oaks leading down to the river, the marsh area, and then beyond that is where the river started. And that river dumps out into the, the Gulf of Mexico. And one of my first art mediums was moss. As a child, I, was, I loved moss. I loved to play in it. I loved to, uh, I had short hair, and I always wanted long hair. My mother never wanted to bother with it. So I would just put moss in my hair, walk around, and then you know, put moss all over my clothes and be a wild child and make little nests with moss. And I would do everything with moss, basically. Moss and sticks and mud. And uh, to me, the moss was really magical. It was just magical substance that just appeared on trees. And I found out later that it's, it's really related to the bromeliad. It's part of the bromeliad family, which is very strange. Um, but the moss ended up showing up in my work later on. So this is a piece that is not in the show out there, but this is a piece that, one of the first pieces that came out of a body of work that I did that everything else in the show is kind of based around. This piece is called Sigils, and it's Spanish moss, and this is a video of the, the work. So the ironwork, I collaborate with a blacksmith, Rachel David, and another one named Scott Chenove, and they help me create these branch structures that I mount on the wall. They usually stick about 8 to 12 inches out from the wall. And I also hang screen. You can see the screen. And the screen just captures a projected image, a linear image, in a very uh, exciting way. I would play with screen a lot in front of video and use different types of sources. But I was really experimenting with how to use video in a sculpture and how to make it, um, make it something that I did not have to turn the lights out for and make it be something that you could show in a gallery under somewhat normal lighting conditions or that somebody could put up you know, in, under ambient lighting conditions in their home. So I was interested in kind of taking video out of the dark room and taking video also out of the frame. You know, whenever we think about filmmaking and video work, we always think about um, the rectangle. The rectangle as being one of the primary compositional elements of filmmaking. You know, you have to deal with composition and how everything fits inside that, that rectangle and what aspect ratio you use is always very important. Things like that are primary considerations of filmmakers. However, I, I didn't want any of that. I just wanted to get, I wanted to get rid of all of that. Uh, I played, so the basis of this work were still photographs that were shot while the moss was spinning and turning. And all of my work is lens-based, so um, I, I usually start with still photos that I then animate into movies, so I just sequence them. I sometimes have to take them out of sequence or resequence them in ways where uh, I get the effect that I want more. And my process is one where I do a lot of time lapse imagery. Sometimes I don't even time lapse it. I'll just spin or move something while I take the photos, sequence them, make movies. And I have collections of movies that are source material that I then start piecing together. This is another example of a, a branch piece. I called them sigils because a sigil is a kind of symbolic structure that looks meaningless. 
to everyone except for the person who made it. And the person who made it usually is making it with some sort of intention in mind. It's a word that's has a, it's kind of magic-y, it has a magic reference, but basically I'm thinking about, um, thinking about being really intentional about the world. And a lot of things I was thinking about at that point in terms of intentionality. The choice to move back to New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina was a, uh, a very intentional choice for everybody who managed to get back because it was not an easy thing. So for a while it felt living there it felt a lot like an intentional community. It's a piece that is installed. Now one of the things I, I'm going to step back a little bit. When I first started doing film and video it was in the 1990s. It was in the period of hell known as analog video. And it was very painful to work with video then. Um, digital technology has made it so much easier. But I was usually shooting with an analog camera and then capturing it, converting it to digital into a computer. And my, my goal back then was to collage video, videos together, basically. Um, I was really influenced by David Hockney's photo collages. I don't know if you know that, but he really experiments with cubism and represent, representing three-dimensional things in two dimensions. Um, some of the other people who I was thinking about at this time were Tony Orsler and Gary Hill, who are video artists who took video out of the frame to a certain degree. Tony Orsler projects on objects and sometimes uh, there are always objects that he makes and he used really interesting small video equipment that he would go to Japan and get. Gary Hill would use multiple television sets and arrange them in space and usually have a single image like a body that was broken up on multiple screens. So that collage based approach to filmmaking was very appealing to me. Um, I was interested in letting rough edges show didn't really want to smooth over things. So one of the things I started doing is making these loops. And there is some audio associated with it, which I'm not hearing. But maybe we'll see it later. So these were, this was called Body of Time. And it was, I was interested in time. I was interested in looping time and that experience of cycling and looping time. And this is another piece where I was doing that collage-based experimentation with video. Uh, multiple sources, and in this case, a historical subject in terms of content. And this is St. Teresa of Avila. She, Dan, do you know if the audio um, is up? Or, I'm sorry? Yeah, we did. We had it earlier. So it's not a big deal. But however, this is St. Teresa interpreted, you know, somewhere in between a um, medieval and contemporary context. So I was just playing with combining different references into the historical story. And basically, the audio consisted of her writings. And then I started moving my attention. I was always very interested in the female body. And I started moving my attention towards, do I need to play something with some audio? Let me know when I do. Towards how the female body is represented via Hollywood um, and what sort of iconic references there were to the female body in classic 20th century Hollywood cinema. So I did this series of pieces called Chaos Hags, where I would identify, <laughs> I, I, it was really an indulgent series because I spent lots of time watching movies. And I, um, you know, Joan Crawford, Marilyn Monroe, Elizabeth, um, oh my god, what's her name? Elizabeth Taylor's mouth, and Jane Russell's. And I was piecing them all together 
in short loops. So I would take actions that they did and piece them all together to create a short animation. This piece draws from Joan Crawford, once again, in Marilyn Monroe's mouth, and then uh, hand, you know, lotion commercials from television where women are always rubbing themselves with certain things. This was a show piece about showgirls in general. And this was a piece about the cigarette in 40s, 50s film, women and cigarettes. And this is a little bit of that piece. We'll see if we've got some audio to go with it. Sorry, hold on. <laughs> okay, I'm working on it. I'm trying to get the thing up. Here we go. So yeah, you might not want to hear all the audio. So I'm going to lower it so I can talk over it a little bit. But basically, the women are embodying extremes of emotions. Um, somewhere between excitement and, and terror was this one. And they're meant to be a bit annoying as well. This one, this one is paranoid. How I feel. They're looking. How I look. How I smell. Look. This was a bit of hygienic paranoia what and the, the running of mental scripts. This was called Charm School. So she starts out nice and sweet. Oh, my magic has me. The movie Showgirls has great mouths in it. <laughs> and once again, the opposites of, of expectations of female behavior. This one's Growing Pains, where a little box, music box, pops up. And in this one, I was drawing from um, uh, issues of puberty, basically. So we have uh, Barbie dolls, we have Natalie Wood from Splendor in the Grass, and we have Linda Blair's uh, face from The Exorcist, and all combined. Also in Tanya Harding, I think, or maybe it was the other one, one of the ice skaters. Um, so. Fear of, fear of growing up, basically. And then I have the, the smoke and mirrors where the women are, women are smoking. Lots of smoking. And it was very just interesting to see how in old movies um, the cigarette was really a, a, a surrogate for sex, basically. You know, um, There's some classic films that end with the cigarette man sharing a cigarette with the woman. I'm just thinking about those things metaphorically. And really, I was critiquing and trying to make obvious these constructions of femininity that had become stereotypical in Hollywood cinema. So that piece is, if anyone really wants to watch it all the way through, it's online. And if you Google chaos hags, it might be the only thing that comes up. No, there's a. Uh, so, just to 
let me backtrack a little bit, though. Well, it, not really backtracking. After that, after I did more work along those lines, uh, Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005, and that was just like any disaster situation that I'm sure many of you might, may have been through. It, as you know, it's a life-changing event that causes uh, all sorts of unexpected things to happen in your life. And it's going to be 10 years next year, and New Orleans is recovering very, very well, it appears, in certain neighborhoods, not so well in others. Uh, one thing Louisiana did was institute a digital tax credit for digital businesses, media businesses. So there's been tons of films being made in, in Louisiana. There's a lot of new businesses in Louisiana, gaming companies. Uh, however, this shape that you see of the state of Louisiana is very deceiving because this bottom half of it is all marshland. It's not solid land. And the other very disconcerting thing, this shape is based on a map from 1932, well, a US Geological Survey map from 1932. But in actuality, everything that is in the red area is lost land, land that was lost. So it's gone from 1932 to 2000. This is a new US Geological Survey map that indicates where in red is where all the land has been lost. And once again, when we're talking about land, we're not talking about land you could build a house on. This is marshland. So from the sky, it looks like land. It's green. There's forests. Uh, however, on the ground, you have, to, you have to take a boat to go through it. You know, it's swamp. It's cypress forest, or it was cypress forest, because now, because of various reasons, uh, it's disappearing. And the one thing that's kind of scary to me, this has really inflected all of my work, not in an obvious way, but in a more subtle way. New Orleans is right here on the map. It's in between the river. This little white line is the river, and this big white thing is a lake. So New Orleans is right by this crescent area in the river right here. It's right, it sits right in there. And pretty soon, I'm worried that the Gulf of Mexico is going to be budding right up against us. And what that means is that uh, it, it practically already is budding right up against us. And the next storm that comes in, and it will come in, I'm pretty sure that'll happen again. So the next storm that comes in, um, the storm surge won't have that marsh to buffer it. The marshland and the cypress forest act as a big sponge that soaks up a 20 or 30 foot storm surge and makes that wall of water diminish so that when it hits the levees, which are all over southeast Louisiana, then the levees will be able to withstand that surge. However, without that, um, I'm, I'm pretty gloomy about the existence of New Orleans. It's very sad to say, but I've got, I'm, you know, I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about it. So it's one of those things that I, um, I have this feeling of loss and concern over. And this piece right here, weather report, was done right after the storm. It's basically, it was just me working out some ideas about weather and the, um, the kind of craziness of predicting the weather. Those are some stills of it. And then I did a couple different versions of it. I was imagining kind of a post-apocalyptic television set where you know, the weather is always basically one way. The futility in predictions. And another piece I had done involved a, a door, a car door I had found after Katrina. And it was just in the middle of the street. So it was interesting walking around and seeing all the different um, things that were lying around in the middle of the road or things that weren't right and wondering what the story was behind them. But the camellia starts as a bud and it ages and it's projected on the, the window of the car.
And this is a piece that you'll see, see in the show. It's called Soft Spots. So in Soft Spots, um, petals fall down the wall and then onto the floor of the, the area. And the projector is, is actually you know, pointing down and projecting on both the wall and the floor. And this piece, um, it involves not just petals from a flower, but there's also a, a little tiny projectile that kind of whizzes by. And as it, as it whizzes by, it changes the trajectory of the petal so that it, it spins off or it falls in a different way or a different pattern. So for me, um, you know, I had been seeing Every year when these Japanese magnolia flowers bloom in the city, they're all over the street, they're all over the road, uh, the sidewalk, and people are walking on top of them. It just becomes this big, lobby mass of petals on the ground. And you can see people's footprints in them, and they're just interesting material, subject matter. So I've been collecting them and scanning them, trying to figure out something to do with them. And I work, I work between Photoshop, Adobe Photoshop, and Adobe After Effects. So. What I was really interested in was um, trying to create a video that was loop-based that a viewer could interact with more like a painting. One of the things I'm, I'm constantly thinking about is um, the viewer's experience of time. And I feel time is, is something that is almost painful in some video installations that I walk in and I'm, I'm coming in the video installation at the wrong time. Um, it, it's frustrating to me sometimes. So I really wanted people to be able to approach a video but with their own sense of time and give it the amount of time that they wanted to give it instead of placing demands on a viewer's time that they have to be there for a certain amount of time in order to watch the piece. And in, in doing this piece over the course of this year, it was um, a, fr a good friend of mine was murdered in the city. So this is really a piece that's strong. It became, after the fact, the lament for this friend, whose name was Helen Hill. She was a great animator, by the way. Uh, deep water dates is something I did that's not video related at all. So I was really interested in flooding and this experience of flooding and how everybody was in shock as if it had never happened before. And, and as I started researching it, I realized that New Orleans is a city that floods all the time. It is always flooded. So I identified these seven different events that uh, the city had flooded during. And I basically picked a section in the middle of the city and mapped the approximate level of the flood water as if they were happening in those areas. And some of them I could be very sure about. For instance, Katrina at the very top, we knew that that much water uh, had been at this corner in mid-city New Orleans. And then also I was there for the May rainstorm, which is number four, and my, my car was flooded in mid-city for that rainstorm. And, um, also, the, the interesting thing to me is that at the very top, along with Katrina, there's this Suave's crevasse. I don't know if I'm saying the first name properly, but a crevasse is a levee break. So there was a levee break in 1849 that immensely flooded the area. However, this area probably would not have been developed in 1849 in New Orleans because it was swamp. It was part of this area called um, the backwater of the city, and it wasn't until pumps and drainage on a large scale was developed around 1900 that New Orleans was able to develop other areas of the city. The, mid, the middle section of the city and the lake, for instance, they had to be pumped out in order to make the land solid and livable. So I was engaging in this research and trying to put flooding into perspective uh, as well, at the same time, I was doing other video work. So this piece is called Early Spring. And the, the impetus for it was the experience of um, coming back to a flooded city and seeing everything covered in brown dust. Everything was brown. Nothing was green. Nothing. So the storm happened in late August. And then for that whole winter, everything was varying degrees of brown. It was just disgusting and dusty 
and smelly. And by uh, the end of winter, though, all of a sudden when spring rolled around, things started changing. And to me, the contrast was the starkest contrast I'd ever seen of an area that had previously been nothing but brown and it looked totally dead and decimated to vibrance. And it was very um, striking to me. So this piece involves projections on the ground. And I had been doing time lapses and doing video animations of flowers for a while, collecting them. Uh, it involves one projector, but six channels of audio. So these are speakers that are you know, computer speakers. They're not um, fancy speakers by any means, but they're also in various degrees of disrepair. They've, some of them have been taken apart in different ways. This is about the scale of it. And you see the wires. The wires for all those speakers just went straight up. So I didn't, I didn't even try to hide wires. Part of it was that um, I liked the metaphor of the wires and the, the plants and vines. It worked together for me. This is kind of a basic installation shot. And up at the top was a DVD player that had surround sound that the audio came out of. So the different speakers had, each had a different experience of sound on them. There's some detail shots of various speakers with the imagery. And the sound was kind of a low bass sound. I teach at an arts high school in New Orleans, so I sometimes collaborate with students and they, they like doing audio. I, wanted, I asked them to make me some really kind of deep bass vibrating noise. And some of the speakers, when I had taken the speaker apart, uh, the speaker would vibrate against the plastic and make sounds. flip-flop back to doing more research, too. I started looking at the history of flooding all along the Mississippi River. And I ran across these amazing maps by a US Army Corps of Engineers engineer named Harold Fisk. And in, 19, in the 1940s, he did a series of maps of the Mississippi River showing all the different paths of the Mississippi River over the course of 300 years. So all of these different squiggly lines, the white one is, was the current river at that time in 1945, I think is when these were published. But all of the other squiggly lines are different courses that the river had taken over the period of 300 years. And the different colors matched to different periods. Uh, and he had a legend on there that you could, you could look it up and tell. And he mapped this, I think, by air and then by soil samples and by surveying. So it was this massive undertaking. But for me, it was just so fascinating to realize that the river has such a, long, has such a wide meander. You know, it's meandering all over the place. It's jumping all over the place. Um, it's flooding all over the place all the time before we put levees up around it. So one of the things I started doing, uh, some work that's very different from my other work, is creating this piece called Short-Term Memory. And it's, it's about how humans, the lifespan and the ideas of time that humans have vary greatly uh, when you look at the archaeological scale of the earth. And it's, um, it, for me, this was a reminder of that, that meander, the way that you're, you're, you're very, for, humans forget. Um, but the earth keeps a record of what's happening. It, and it also was really inspired by how, these are some installation shots from the soap factory in uh, Minneapolis. 
I was really interested in how the, well, the river was also like one big drawing. It was a line that was wandering all over the place. So it was a, it was a big drawing made over time. And I find that um, just a very inspirational thought and kind of terrifying at the same time. So the piece, you know, the piece that you see here is one that's in the show. The name is Repercussions. It incorporates a physical sense of sound. Uh, there is a speaker that, I'll show you a little bit of it here. There's a drip that happens and the sound of the drip is actually coming out of the speaker. And you can see that in the gallery. And this flower is a trumpet flower, or known as a Bergmansia. They're yellow, they're salmon colored. They're really beautiful flowers. And this was a piece that you have not seen in the gallery. It's called Tizzy, and it was based off of some zinnias. And for me, um, just ex experimenting with the profusion of color and different ways of projecting video was what was happening with this piece. The disc is a round piece of wood that's about a yard uh, in diameter, and it's covered with beeswax. So I'm really interested in surface and how video will look different on different surfaces. I'm, I do project on flat walls quite often, but I'm interested in exploring that surface more and figuring out how to get different results. The beeswax manages to contain an image in an interesting way. So I've also been experimenting with glass and trying to figure out how to capture an image in glass. And you'll see a piece that's based on wisteria in the gallery that has some glass elements in it. This piece is Gushers. Oh, let me try and it is a series of lilies that come up out of a bunch of broken up speakers at the bottom. And the speakers have this buzzing, hissing noise, staticky noise coming out of them. And conveniently, I can plug the wires in to the wall right there. And then the, the petals end up ending in some explosions. And it loops over again. This piece was made in collaboration with my husband. It's called Holding Pattern. And it involves petals projected on a flat floor, just on the floor. But uh, we did a crazy experiment with Maya 3D software where we mapped the front and the back of the petals to some 3D digitally made petals that my husband had made. And per, in perspective, using you know trick of perspective, we made the petals bigger and then smaller looking when they appeared to move on or uh, land on the floor. So per perception, perceptual tricks are things that I'm pretty interested in experimenting more with. Uh, and then one of the flowers that I've done the most variations with is the night blooming cereus. It only blooms at night. Uh, it blooms, some of them only bloom once a year, but the ones that, that I've been working with usually bloom twice a year. And they'll have multiple blooms on them. And here I'm just collaging with little TV screens. And uh, here I did, I experimented with some different arrangements for a specific uh, event at the New Orleans Museum of Art. But then I also would rearrange the pattern of the flowers to project in different places. So this is an example of a more site specific installation at a place called the Pearl, which is an ancient, it was built in 1799, a, a very old 
Creole cottage that uh, was part of a show during Prospect 2, which uh, Prospect is a biennial that happens in New Orleans. And it's called a biennial, however, it doesn't happen every two years. It usually takes longer. And um, there was all media happening in this really old house that was not renovated. So the place was really in this crazy, decrepit, crumbling down stage. And it was inter interesting to see all these media, to have all these media-based experiences in this really old situation. The, uh, the way that the site informed all of the different video was fascinating. But I was able to project in the giant clawfoot tub. And I really like how the video works on porcelain. So I'm hoping to maybe do some experiments along those lines. And this is the piece that you will see in the gallery. This piece is called Sleepwalkers as well. Now, this similar piece right here is a variation on one piece that's in the gallery, the interactive piece. This was the first interactive piece that I did with my husband. It's called Dream Catchers, and it's a series of four Night Blooming series that will open and close based on you walking by them. And the space of the projection is divided up into different zones. So when motion happens in those different zones, just the flower that is in that, that one zone will respond. So you can get picky with it and just make one flower move or the other flower move. For me, these flowers embody something. I find them really beautiful, but I also find them terrifying at the same time. So I think that combination uh, is, is something I like to work with, those extremes of feeling put together. And it also mimics a little bit about how I feel living where I live, that uh, beauty and terror simultaneously. And for me, it's also about um, this plant just kind of looks like this green cactus until all of a sudden you'll see this amazing uh, bloom pop up. And it, it looks like this, <laughs> you know, the whole time it looks alive like some sort of creature, an animal. And then it'll just get puffier and puffier. And then one morning I'll walk out and all of a sudden it's lying on the ground, dead. And I, I miss the bloom. Uh, so for me, I forget, sometimes you forget that the flower's going to bloom. <laughs> or it's suddenly they'll, it'll surprise you. All of a sudden there's a, a bud there. So, and I think New Orleans in particular, there's this, this really desire to forget. The city is a lot, a lot of the city. The city has a very strong uh, personality, and a lot of it's about forgetting, and then a lot of the city is also about remembering. So remembering the past, um, and, but then forgetting the past, too, the things that you don't want to remember. So that, that tension between remembering and forgetting is something that I find very, very strong. Uh, I'm really interested in the way that technology is used to cultivate reality. So part of what, you know, why I chose that name cultivar, I feel like movies, I feel like Hollywood and special effects um, are basically cultivating our, our senses and our reality in a strange way. Media experiences, which is how most people experience nature, most people in first world experience nature today, is through some sort of screen. You know, media experiences can give you really unrealistic expectations of something. And that, that's something that I play with a lot in my work. Um, I feel like I'm, a, I'm some sort of digital cultivator or a digital meddler in reality. And I'm just doing it in this really specific little area with botanicals. However, I'm making the botanicals do things that they're not scientific in any way. I'm making them do things that they never would do in a natural setting. So that's basically the direction that my work is continuing to move in. I'm hoping to do more interactive work as well. And that is the end of my talk. So <laughs> I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Um, and I might not have given Lenny enough uh, warning about that. But 
I hope you were able to go in the gallery and experience the, the work. Thank you very much. <laughs> Really? Yeah. Awesome. Could you could you ask that one more time? I, I'm having some difficulty hearing. Yeah. Oh. Oh. You mean like how do I get to the studio, or how do I get to like trans? Um, wear the different hats, kind of emotionally. You know, I think it's just something I've done for a long time because I teach, and I've been teaching since 1991 in different schools and different situations. So uh, it's, it's just something that naturally happens. And really, it's something that um, I force, you know, I, I constantly force myself to do because I know one day I'm going to do it full time. So, <laughs> you know, but I don't know if that answers your question, really. It's, it's something that um, I kind of don't think about just because I have to do it. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? OK. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm so glad you got to see it at the Pearl. Thank you. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think with my process, I started making it and animating the flower parts and the petals. But I felt like I needed something to give it um, more depth, more meaning, or more of an edge, or to relay you know, more of my experience of a combination of beauty with some other sort of feeling. Um, so I was, I, I just tri was trying to think about what can I include, what can I add, what can I add to this piece to make it um, a little more meaningful. And it was the year after my friend had been murdered. And she had been murdered in a home invasion. And the, the worst part of it was that she, um, she, all of her friends who had moved back to New Orleans begged her and her husband to return. We just wanted her to come back so bad because she was such a great person. So you know, all of us then ended up feeling somewhat responsible for the horrible thing that happened to her uh, because we had convinced them to return to the city. And you know, we needed her, we needed her creativity. You know, she was just a great el element in the art community there. So uh, for me, that piece is just a lot about how you have to be careful what you wish for and also just how one little thing can change your trajectory, your life trajectory, in, way, in, in ways that you don't even know, you don't even really understand what that element is that changes your trajectory sometimes, but it happens, and you might not understand that until later, much later in your life. So. Yeah. You know, I have a really dystopic view of my work in a way, because um, I, I'm, I'm like eating up electricity while I'm projecting the imagery, 
and I'm, I'm aware of that, but I'm not quite sure what to do about that part of it. I've been researching a little bit about solar projectors, which I don't think really exists yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but there are some people who have been working on that. Um, so uh, yeah, that's one concern of mine. I'm also, the other sort of uh, worst case scenario thing I think about is how eventually one day this sort of stuff that I do might substitute for the real thing and that always makes me depressed. But I do think about, um, you know, how the work fits in to the environment and how it is not really an environmental, uh, it's, it doesn't, you know, it's not going to be saving energy in any way, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do hope that it, it does help people question their relationship more to, you know, to the plants. And especially oak trees, they're so very symbolic, laden with all sorts of nostalgia as well as pain. And uh, I, find, I just find it interesting to see who's drawn to those images too. And, um, you know, what it, it just it becomes a topic of conversation, I think, a way for people to interact and we'll talk about issues that are deeper. I'm sorry, a lot of what? <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it is something I thought about. Yeah, it's, a, it's something that I've been working out a little bit in my head, thinking about fountains and shallow bowls and what I can work with those, or what I can do with those, or how I can make forms that I would then, that would hold water, that I would project in. I mean, there have been some artist work I've seen that do that, that project in water that's really beautiful. Um, but I think it just has to be the right place too, and it seems like it would be a really good site-specific type of, type of work. Good idea. <laughs> All right. Yeah, of what I love. It's, it's really the most, the most influential thing. You know, if I lived in a different place, I'm sure I would make different work. Um, so it, it, I live in this neighborhood called the Irish Channel, and it's right next to this other neighborhood called the Garden District, and that's where we end up exercising and walking. So it's, it's called the Garden District because of the amazing plants, and <laughs> plants that you see there. And that's been really influential to me over the years, just watching all those cycles of plants, watching them change. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of metaphorical content there that I sometimes hint at with the title, but usually I try not to spell it out, you know? because I think that they're gonna, it's gonna be different for different viewers. So does that answer? Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. Yeah, but definitely, it's a, you know, flowers have always been uh, metaphorical content in botanicals and in still lifes. You know, flowers are a lot about cycles of rebirth and death, uh, which is very much what I've been living through and experiencing. And um, they're, they're sometimes used as memento mori, reminders of death. And those are all influences of mine too, you know, uh, old masters and Dutch 
Dutch still lives. No. Okay. Do you, I'll talk to you in the museum. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you.